Hello, so let us continue with what we were talking last time. So I'm continuing with modular operations. So we're going to do right now exponentiation. So let me do um, x to the y, which would be exponentiation. And I'm going to write a method that's going to be called power from x to the y. And this operation, uh, as we recall, these are going to be done mod n. All right, so exponentiation operation can be done in the following way. So basically similar to what we did before, we can do x to the 2 to the y over 2. Now in this case, there are two choices for y. We can have if y is even, then we have x to the y is equal to x to the 2 to the y over 2. And if y is odd, then we would have x to the y is equal to x to the 2y over 2, the floor, plus 1, right? So that means that we can write a recursive algorithm in the case of exponentiation. So it's going to be power x to the y. And so we're going to say if y is equal to 0, then it's going to be x to the 0, so we just return 1. Otherwise, we just compute um, recursively. Let's use z equals to the power of, so recursively compute the power of x to the floor of y divided by 2, so that we do exactly what we are doing here. So notice that in, in both cases, we have the following. Um, so this is equal to x to the y over 2 squared. And this is equal to x times x to the y over 2 squared. Right, so we're going to be using these two conditions. So in the case, so you just compute z, which is actually x to the y over 2. So this is a z in this case, and this is a z in this case. So if y is even, then we just return z squared. And to compute z squared, we just have to multiply z times z, which is just a product, and that can be done very easily. If y is odd, then we just return. So this would be x times z squared. So that is just going to be x times z times z, or z squared. OK, so that pretty much uh, takes care of the power um, method. So the running time of the power method is going to be how long? The product that I have to perform here and here, remember that products are in the order of n squared. And the number of times that we have to compute the recursive call from this, remember every time we divide it by 2, that is one shift, and that that means that we are going to have one less bit. So if we had n bits initially, this will require us to have in the order of n calls. So the total running time for this algorithm is going to be in the order of n cube. So we can compute uh, x to the y in the order of n cube. So continuing with uh, algorithms for numbers, I want to compute the GCD of two numbers, x and y, and GCD being the greatest common divisor. So the idea is, you, in order to compute this number, what you have, you have the divisors of x. So all numbers that can divide x. And uh, you compute also the divisors of y. You take the union, the intersection of those, so you have the common divisors, and you take the maximum of those numbers. 
So in order to do this, we're going to be using a very old algorithm. And this algorithm is based on the following fact uh, that we are going to show. We will prove that it is possible to compute the greatest common divisor of x and y equal to the greatest common divisor of the following numbers, y and x mod y. So it is easy to, to use that strategy. So let me give an example. Suppose that I want to compute the greatest common divisor of 1,035 and 758. 759. All right, so I'm going to co compute the common divisor of those two, the GCD. So I write x here, y here, and I'm going to do the following. So initially we start with uh, 1035 and 759. I'm going to arrange the numbers in such a way that this number here is greater than this number that is on this side. All right, and the next thing that we have to do is we're going to compute the GCD of y, x mod y. So y now is going to be here. So I'm going to move this y here to this position. So that is 759. And this is going to be 1035 mod 759. So how do we compute the mod of, uh, of that? So remember, um, 10,035 mod 759 is equal to 10,035 minus an integer number of times 759. In this case, that integer number of times is going to be one so this is just going to be 1035 minus 759, which is going to be equal to 276. All right, and then we just continue this method again. I'm just going to put this 276 here. And then I'm going to compute 759 mod 276. So we perform the same operation again and see uh, that the remainder of dividing 759 by 276 is equal to 207. Now again, this 207 goes here as y, and then I have to compute the remainder of dividing 276 by 207, and that gives me a value of 69. Again, the 69 goes here, and I'm going to compute the remainder of dividing 207 by uh, 69, and that is going to give me a remainder of zero. So once I reach this remainder of zero here, we know that the value that then we end up here, this x, is actually the greatest common divisor. So this is equal to d, the d that we want. All right, so it's very easy to write an algorithm to do this, a recursive algorithm. Let me just write it here very briefly. So we want to compute GCD of x and y. So what is our exit condition? Our exit condition is going to be when this value here is equal to zero. So for the exit condition, we have if y is equal to zero, just return x. That is correct, right? Whenever y is equal to zero, just d is equal to x. So we just return x. Otherwise, we're going to return the GCD of y and x mod y. So what we want to show at this point is that the greatest common divisor of x and y is equal to the greatest common divisor of y and x mod y. All right, so in order to show this, we're going to do the following. We're going to show a simpler, simplified case of this, 
where basically we're going to show instead of equal to y x mod y we are going to show that gcd of x y is equal to the gcd of a of a y and x minus n y for some particular n so we're going to use this definition instead of using this definition that we have here all right so in order to do that we're going to show this in two phases so in the first phase we're going to assume that we already know that the greatest common divisor is d so i'll assume that d is the greatest common divisor of x and y so from here we know that since this is the greatest common divisor of x and y then d divides x and d divides y so we know that x can be written as n y n1 let's write n1 d and y can be written as n2 d because d divides both of them it's the greatest common divisor so not only divides them but it's the greatest common divisor then i'm going to write this value here x minus n y and see where we can get from here so based on these two definitions what would x minus n y be so x minus n y would be equal to x which is n1 d minus n y which would be n times n2 d and this is equal to notice that i can factor the d from here so it's going to be d times n1 minus n times n2 d ah d is already there so this is just a number which is an integer and we know this because of closure properties of integers, right? We know that n1, n2, and n, all of those are integers, and therefore this entire number here is an integer. Therefore, this means that d divides x minus ny. So this implies that, let me write it like this, d divides the following two numbers. It divides x minus ny, and also, it divides y. Right? So notice it divides y and divides x minus n y. So this implies that d is a common divisor of the ones that I wrote here y and x minus n y. But if it's a common divisor, then it has to be, since this is the greatest common divisor, so it has to be less than or equal to the greatest common divisor, right? Because if, if we look at the greatest common divisor of y and x minus ny, any divisor, d, has to be less than or equal to the greatest common divisor of those two numbers. So this implies that d has to be less than or equal to the greatest common divisor of the two numbers that we said that it divides, right? It divides y and it divides x minus n y. So it has to be less than or equal to the greatest common divisor of those two. But we already know that we decided that d was going to be equal to the greatest common divisor of x and y. So the greatest common divisor of x and y has to be equal to this value, which is less than or equal to the greatest common divisor of those two. So from here, we have this inequality that we're going to use in just a second. All right, so from here, I'm going to go to the second part. So in the second part, probably you already know what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to sandwich the value in between two numbers. And in order to do that, I'm going to then assume that I have another D so assume now that I have another D and that this D is actually equal to the greatest common divisor of Y and X mod Y. So again, doing the same that I did here, we know then that if this is a common divisor of those two, then that means that Y can be written as, let's say, M1D and x mod y, which I'm writing it like this, x minus ny, is equal to, since d is a common divisor, to some m to d. And so I'm going to 
From here, I can obtain what the value of x is. So solving the second one for x gives me the following. So this implies that x is equal to m to the plus ny. And notice that y can be written as m1d. So then x is equal to m to the plus n times y, which is m1d. And so I can factor d from here and get m2 plus n m1. But we know that m2 is an integer, n is an integer, and m1 is an integer. Therefore, because of closure properties of integers, this number has to be an integer value. And so that implies that d divides x. Right, so that, is imp that implies that d divides x, and we already knew that d divided y. So if d divides x and d divides y, then d is a common divisor. of x and y. And since it's a common divisor, then this d has to be less than or equal to the greatest common divisor of x and y. But in this case, we already said that d was the greatest common divisor of y and x minus ny. All right, so from here we get this inequality that we can use. So now what we're going to do next is we're going to combine these two inequalities in just one, because notice that these two have one thing in common. They have this GCD of y x minus ny here, GCD of y minus ny here, and so Combining those two inequalities, I can say the following. So, sandwiching this GCD of y, x minus ny, this is sandwiched in between. So, because of this one here, GCD of y, x minus ny is greater than or equal to GCD of x and y. And from here, we have that the GCD of y, x minus n, y is less than or equal to the GCD of x and y. And therefore, since this is in between those two values, then it has to be equal. So therefore, the GCD of x and y has to be equal to the GCD of y and x minus n, y, which is in turn equal to the GCD of y, x, mod y. And this is what we wanted to show. All right, so that we know that Euclid's algorithm is correct, I'm going to, uh, to write another algorithm, which is an extension of Euclid's algorithm. So I'm going to call it extended Euclid's algorithm. And this extended version of the of Euclid's algorithm is based on the following property. So we have a little lemma uh, that says that if d divides x and y, so it's a common divisor of x and y, and also it happens that d is equal to a linear combination of x and y, but where alpha and beta are integers, where alpha and beta are some integer numbers, and remember that integer numbers those could be negative, okay, so just keep in mind that those alpha and beta both could be negative. If that happens, then d is actually equal to the greatest common divisor of x and y.
So if I know that this is a common divisor of x and y, how do I know that it's the greatest common divisor? If there are two numbers, alpha and beta, such that if I multiply alpha times x and add that plus beta times y and I get that t, that means that that t is actually the greatest common divisor of x and y. I want to show the lemma that we just described before. So in order to do this, we want to show that so this is going to be a formal proof. We're going to show that the GCD of x and y is equal to some constant alpha x plus beta y. For this, alpha and beta are just integers. Remember that an integer could include zero or even negative numbers. So this is something important to keep in mind. All right, so this is the property that we want to show. And in order to show this property true, we're going to show it by induction. So we're going to show this by induction based on the size of x and y. So we're going to see how this works. So let me start by using uh, our induction strategy. So let me do a base case or the basis for our induction. And in the case of the basis for our induction, I'm going to start with the case of trying to compute the GCD of x and zero. Remember when we had our table, when we computed x, y using Euclid's method, we keep moving this y into this position and here we would write, remember, x mod y, and we keep moving this, right, until we have in this table, the last entry that we have, we have a value of x, and we have a value of zero. And at that point, we say that d is equal to this x that we wrote here. Remember, so this was the process that we used in Euclid's algorithm to compute it. All right, so this would be the case to compute the greatest common divisor of x and zero. And remember that we said that the greatest common divisor of x and zero is going to be equal to, in this case, x, right? So the greatest common divisor of that is going to be equal to x. Notice that x can be written as alpha x plus beta y. So this y in this case is equal to zero. In the case where alpha is equal to one, and beta is equal to zero. All right, so for the base case, we can clearly see that the greatest common divisor can be written as a linear combination of those two numbers. The theorem that we want to prove is true for that particular case, for the base case. So let me assume now as part of our inductive hypothesis, Let's assume that the property is true for smaller values of x and y. So assume that we have that x prime is less than x and y prime is less than y. So smaller values. We're going to assume that the condition for those two is actually true. So what I want to prove is true for those two values. So the greatest common divisor of x prime and y prime can be written as a linear combination of those two numbers. So it's going to be alpha prime, x prime, plus beta prime, y prime, where this alpha prime and beta prime are integer numbers. So we assume that this is true for values that are smaller than x and y. Uh, so we're using uh, the version of induction, which is called the strong induction, Remember that in the normal induction proof, we are going to assume that the property is true for k, and then we are going to prove that the property is true for k plus 1. In the case of a strong induction, that is the one that we are using, we are going to assume that the property is true for any value that is less than, in this case, x and y, and then we are going to use some other property in order to show that it's actually true for x and y. So in our inductive step, finally, we want to show that the property is true, not this step, we want to show that the property is true for x and y. So we want to use, uh, to show that the greatest common divisor of x and y is equal to some alpha x plus beta y. So this is what we want to show.
All right, so in order to compute this on a smaller values, so remember that we know that it's possible to compute this with smaller values, right? Greatest common divisor of x and y is equal to the greatest common divisor using Euclid's formula. We know that this is equal to the greatest common divisor of y and x mod y. But remember that in x mod y, we can write it in the following way, greatest common divisor of y, and the formula for x mod y is x minus x over y times y. All right, now notice that something very important. y is actually less than x. Remember that we said that we are always going to write them in such a way that this value here is smaller than this value here, right? So y is less than x, but also it is very important here to notice that the value that I have here, which is x mod y, is actually less than y. All right, so if I divide, if I compute the remainder of dividing number by three, the value that I get is always going to be less than three. So we know that this value here is less than y. So I can use my inductive hypothesis in this case, because I know that it satisfies these two conditions, this one less than that one, right? We said in the inductive hypothesis that x prime should be less than x and y prime should be less than y. So in this case, we know that this value is smaller than x and this value here is smaller than y. Therefore, I can use the inductive hypothesis, which implies that, so using the inductive hypothesis, this implies that alpha prime, so there are two numbers, integers, a prime, b prime, such that, so greatest common divisor of y, x mod y, is equal to alpha prime, so think about it, right? So alpha prime, x prime, which is y, plus beta prime, y prime, which is x mod y, which is actually in turn x minus x over y times y. So this implies that the greatest common divisor of y x mod y is equal to, so let me factor the y's here and the x on the other side. So let me write it like this, beta prime x prime, sorry, beta prime x plus, and then I'm going to factor the y, I get alpha prime minus beta prime x over y, and this times y. All right, so notice, that this is equal to, so this, I can say that this is some alpha because this beta prime, we know that is an integer. Now alpha prime is an integer, beta prime is an integer. This number here, x divided by y floor is an integer. So I can say that this is an integer, let's call it beta. So what we end up with is alpha x plus beta y. And also remember that this GCD of uh, y x mod y was actually equal to the GCD of x and y. So what we see from here is then that the property, what we want us to show, let me see if we had enough space here to put it here. All right, so the property that we wanted to show is to show that the GCD of x and y was alpha x plus beta y. So we have here, that the GCD of x and y is alpha x plus two beta y. So this actually proves what we wanted to show. And it tells us a little bit more because it tells us how to compute the value of alpha and beta. So it tells us that alpha is equal to beta prime and beta is equal to alpha prime minus beta prime times the floor of x divided by y. And we can use this as part of an algorithm. 
All right, so let me write an, a complete algorithm to compute uh, the uh, e Euclid's value. So let, and I'm going to use this formula that I just got here, right? So I'm going to base this algorithm in the proof that we just wrote. So this is going to be called Euclid, as we, as we said before, of x and y. And this algorithm returns three numbers, alpha, beta and d. All right, so in order to write this algorithm, this algorithm is going to be a recursive algorithm based on the proof that we just wrote. So the first thing that we have to uh, identify is the base case. So the base case is obtained when y is equal to zero. So when y is equal to zero, we just return, as we said before, in the base case, the coefficients alpha is going to be one, beta, we said that it was going to be zero, and the greatest common divisor d is just x. So this is based on the base case of our inductive proof that we had before. And then we're going to compute the value of Euclid in smaller values. So we're going to compute the new value, called it, we call it alpha prime, beta prime, and d. Notice that d does not change d is the greatest common divisor, even in the other cases. So I'm going to compute this for Euclid. So it is going to be y and x mod y. Those returns those two values. As we said before, y now is smaller than x, x mod y is smaller than y, and so this is going to be a recursive call on smaller values. All right, so once we did that, I have alpha prime and beta prime. From those, I can compute the alpha and betas that I'm going to return for the values of x and y. So alpha is equal to beta prime. Beta is equal to alpha prime minus beta times the floor of x divided by y. And then finally, we just return the values alpha, which is computed like this, beta, and sorry, this is beta prime, right? This is beta prime from our formula here, okay? So we return alpha, beta, and the greatest common divisor, which was returned here from this operation, right? Was returned from the other, from the recursive call. And that pretty much is our extended version of Euclid's algorithm. Okay, so time complexity. So remember that we start, we want to compute the GCD of X and Y, and we end up computing the GCD of X and, sorry, Y and X mod Y. So we end up computing this one instead of that one so that we can use it recursively. All right, so time complexity of the algorithm. I'm going to bring here the algorithm so we can take a look at it in just a second. So in order to analyze this algorithm, what we would want to do is we would want to analyze basically uh, how many times this recursive call is going to be made. So basically, in order to do that, we have to analyze how much this value here that is sent recursively is going to be reduced uh, during every iteration. So in order to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to analyze the size of x mod y when compared to the following. So let me say that I have x here. So this is x and I'm going to have two cases and let me draw x also here. Okay. So I have two cases so for y, there are two possible choices. So let me put here x over 2, and let me put here x over 2. So there are two possible cases. Let me do case number 1, which is what would happen if y is less than or equal to x over 2. So this is the way that we have. Okay. Remember, we have to compute the greatest common divisor of x and y. 
So there are two choices for y. y could be less than or equal to x over 2. Or in case number 2, y could be greater than x over 2. All right. So if y is less than or equal to x over 2, x mod y is equal to what? Well, we know that x mod y is always going to be less than or equal to less than y, right? x mod y is less than y. So x mod y is less than y, but y is uh, less than or equal to x over 2. Therefore, we have that x mod y is less than or equal to x over 2. So this is case number 1. Case number 2, y is greater than x over 2. All right, so that means that y is somewhere here, right? This is y. y is greater than half of that. So if that is the case, then what is x mod y? You probably already thought about the answer, right? x mod y is just going to be x minus y. And so if x minus y is x minus y and, great, and y is greater than x over 2, then that means that x minus x mod y has to be less than x minus x over 2, which is equal to x over 2. So we have that x mod y, again, less than or equal to x over 2. So that means that every point, every time that the, the algorithm is called recursively, the value that is sent to the right-hand side is going to be decremented in half, right? Because x mod y is less than or equal to x over 2. So the value is less than or equal to half the original value. So in bits, since division by 2 is just a shift, so this implies that every time it's one less bit. At least, it could be more than one less bit. So, uh, in running time, worst case, just one bit every time, that requires order of n iterations. And by iteration, I mean call of the um, recursive call. So, what other operation is performed in here? We have to compute x mod y in, in each case. And x mod y, how long does it take? x mod y takes in the order of n squared. So because we perform n iterations of n squared operations each, then the total running time is going to be in the order of n cube. So let me briefly talk about division. So suppose that we want to do x over y mod n. So we're using module operations here. This can be written like this, x, y to the minus 1, mod n, where y to the minus 1 is the multiplicative inverse. I'm just going to call it inverse of y. OK, so what is inverse of a given number? So suppose. that a is the inverse of y. What I want is for a times y, if I multiply them together, a times y, I want that to be equal to 1. So in terms of modular operations, being equal to 1 means that it's congruent to 1 mod n. All right, so let's try some example, well, a little example to see what would happen in this case and if it is at all possible to always have an inverse of a number. So an example, let's suppose that I'm using n equals 4, and suppose that I want the multiplicative inverse of 2, so y is equal to 2. So that would require me to find a number a such that a times 2 is congruent to 1 mod 4. 
But what are the possible candidates? I'm mod, mod for arithmetic, right? So possible candidates for A are just 0, 1, 2, and 3, because I am in mod for arithmetic. All right, so um, what if A is equal to 0? Do I get a remainder of 1, one when I divide it? So 0 times 2, that is 0. So that is not congruent to 1 mod 4. What about 1? 1 times 2, that is 2. That is not congruent to 1, so the remainder of dividing by 4 is not equal to 1. 2 times 2, that is 4. Remainder of dividing by 4 is not equal to 1. And 2 times 3, so that would be 6. Uh, the remainder of dividing that by 4 is not equal to 1. So none of those can be the inverse. So in this case, there is no inverse. So what we notice is that the problem that we're having, because we don't have an inverse, or the reason for not having an inverse, is because 4 and 2 actually have common factors. So it's possible to show, but I'm not going to show it. So uh, the multiplicative inverse, let me call it mi, or the inverse, of y, mod n exists if and only if y and n have no common factors. Right, what does it mean for them to have no common factors? That means that the greatest common divisor of y and n is going to be equal to 1. So if we had decided to use our Euclid algorithm to compute alpha, beta, and d, Euclid of y and n, what we would have is that this d should be equal to 1, otherwise it has uh, no inverse, and we cannot compute the division. So as long as this is equal to 1, I would know that 1 is going to be equal to alpha y plus beta n and that is going to be congruent to 1 mod n. But notice that I'm doing more than operation. This is already a multiple of n, so the only relevant term would be a alpha y congruent to 1 mod n. But notice that what I have here is actually the definition of the inverse. So alpha happens to be the multiplicative inverse of y. So if we want to compute the multiplicative inverse of y and of course mod n, then what I have to do is I would have to compute the alpha coming from the algorithm. So that means that I can write now uh, the algorithm to divide two numbers. So for the division algorithm, we want to compute divide x divided by y mod n. So as we said before, first thing that we have to do is use Euclid's algorithm. To determine if y and n have common factors. So from here, I can say that uh, they have no common factors as long as d is equal to 1. So if d is not equal to 1, then I'm going to just return some kind of error. Otherwise, I'm going to return the value of the multiplication of alpha y mod n. And that is basically the entire division algorithm. So how long does it take? Well, Euclid's algorithm, so let's say complexity. Euclid's algorithm, as we said before, takes in the order of n cube. This condition just takes constant time, and multiplication takes in the order of n square. So the time complexity for the division algorithm is in the order of n cube. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about prime numbers. Algorithms for prime numbers are very important with respect to cryptography. We are not going to talk about cryptography in detail, 
but we're going to provide some of the basic uh, theory that you need in order to understand cryptography. I'm just very briefly going to talk about prime numbers today and our next lecture we're going to talk a little bit more in detail about how prime numbers are, can be computed faster. So what is a prime number? A prime number is a number that is divisible only by one and itself. So prime numbers are two, three, five, seven, and so on. So it is very important to try to determine if a number is prime or it is not prime. So the two uh, possible cases are either a number is prime or a number is composite. Composite means that it can be seen as a product of primes. And this requires more than at least two primes. So notice that uh, number one, uh, some time ago it was considered to be a prime number, but one is not prime. Even though it satisfies the definition of being divided only by one and itself, but um, in this case, one and itself is the same. So, um, because of some problems with some theorems, people decided not to include one as a prime number as part of the definition. So, in this case, composite gets easier because it says, all right, it's a product of primes at least two, and that means that they cannot be one. So, um, this actually makes a little bit more sense from the theoretical point of view. So something else that we know that uh, we're going to is going to be helpful when determining if a number is prime or not. So we want to find the factors. Let's say that we want to factor a number n, a times b. We always know that either a is less than or equal to the square root of n, or b is less, is less than or equal to the square root of n. Notice that it might not happen that both are greater than the square root of n. If a is greater than the square root of n and b is greater than the square root of n, then a times b would be actually greater than n, which was not the case because we said that n was equal to a times b. Right? So that means that a has to be less than or equal to the square root of n, or b has to be less than or equal to the square root of n. So that might be helpful to shave some time of a uh, uh, very naive algorithm to determine if a number is prime or not. So naive primality testing, a very simple algorithm to determine if a number is prime or it's not prime. Uh, prime of a number n, let me call it n. I'm going to determine if prime, if n is prime or not prime. So for each number, starting from 2 all the way to the square root of n. And of course, square root of n because of the previous thing that we talked about. If i divides n, return false. Otherwise, if I'm able to reach the end and I, not of the, none of these i's up to the square root of n, of n was able to divide n, then return true, uh, meaning that it is prime. All right, so how long does it take? So it's very easy. It is square, square root of n, where n is the actual number, and the time that it takes for me to check to see if i divides n, let's say that it, it requires in the order of what time? Well, n written as binary numbers uh, has a length of n. So the length of the input is n. 
for this value. So the value is capital N, the length is lowercase n. We know that the value and the actual length are related in the following way, right? We know that n, the actual value, is in, in the order of 2 to the n, where n is uh, the length. Right, so in this case, this is in the order of n squared with respect to the length, but this is a square root of n with respect to the value. So if we replace this square root, so this would be in the order of square root of n, but n is in the order of 2 to the n, so that is going to be 2 to the n over 2 times something like n squared. Okay? So notice this algorithm is an exponential algorithm, which is very, very, very bad algorithm. Uh, it takes too long in order for, for it to be of any practical use. All right, so the question is, can we do better? All right, so next time, I'm going to talk about a way of uh, actually trying to do better with respect to primality testing. The problem for doing better is that it's not going to be a fixed algorithm. It's going to be a probabilistic algorithm or a randomized algorithm where we're going to say that uh, it is going to be, the answer is going to be prime with a given probability, which is going to be very high, right? almost certainty, but uh, it's still going to have a probability of uh, it not to be prime, even though we might say that it's prime. All right, so that is all for today, and um, I will talk to you next time. Bye.